Yang terhormat Dr. Mansour Osman, Deputy Minister of Higher Education, representing Yang Bahamad Dr. Noraini Ahmad, the Minister, Yang Bahamad Dr. Dr. Yusof Yaakob, Minister of Education and Innovation for Sabah, Yang Bahagia Dr. Pramjit Singh, President of MECPU, Yang Bahagia Associate Professor Elas Elas Solan Mohan, President of NAPE, Tan Sri Tan Sri Dato Dato, Distinguished Speakers, Ladies and Gentlemen. Allow me at the outset to extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this Malaysia Education and Learning Summit 2020. We are very grateful to Yang Bahamad Dato Mansor for representing the Minister to deliver the keynote address at today's summit. It is one of the few times that we have a minister in the higher education ministry who was himself an academic, a professor, and a distinguished scholar. And I think this is a very apt and appropriate ministry for you to be in, having spent so many years in uh, USM in Penang. Ladies and gentlemen, this summit I believe is apt and timely as we need to discuss the new normal in education. There are very many challenges facing educational institutions, both public and private, and both tertiary and in schools that we face following the COVID pandemic. For some of the private universities, one of the big challenges is the sustainability of private higher education and to build business resilience into these institutions, particularly in the light of a drop in foreign student recruitment, the need to effectively manage cash, cash flow and the challenge of cost containment. For all other institutions, the challenge of virtual learning is also a great challenge as well as an opportunity that we face. It can perhaps be appropriate for us to recall the words of Charles Dickens in his Tale of Two Cities when he spoke or wrote about the best of times and the worst of times. And rightly, I think the whole country, in fact the whole world, is experiencing both the best and the worst of times. The Chinese character Wei Qi, danger, denotes the two characters of danger and opportunity. And that is, in summary, the crisis that we face today. I think that when we look forward to think about education in the new normal, we need to take into account what I would perhaps summarize as the five T's. First T being the new normal in teaching, virtual learning, that is crucial and important for us to take into account. Second T, technology in this virtual world and virtual online learning. Technology is becoming very important and when we talk about online education, we need to also take into account that in rural areas, many students do not have access to internet and may have poor access also to computers. Third T, talent. We need universities to focus on creating and developing the jobs of the future, to be industry relevant, and to be able to also take into account the growing need for TVET education. And the last T to me is trust, because I think educational institutions must be able to develop trust with your stakeholders, parents, students, and all the other stakeholders that you need to take into account in the new environment. So we hope that today's summit will enable that sharing of knowledge, ideas, and insights from many distinguished speakers that we have put together. And we hope that you will be able to take opportunity of this summit to think 
about the future of Malaysian education and to chart the way forward for our education system. Let me end by thanking once again the Honourable Deputy Minister, Minister from Sabah, for being with us here this morning. Thank you to our many strategic partners and our sponsors for this event, and to our speakers also, terima kasih. Sekian, terima kasih. A very good morning to Yang Berhormat Datuk Mansur Osman, Deputy Minister of Higher Education Malaysia. Yang Berhormat Datuk Dr. Yusof bin Yaakob, Minister of Education and Innovation Sabah. Yang Bahagia Tan Sri Dr. Michael Yeo, President KSI Strategic Institute for Asia Pacific. Yang Bahagia Datuk Pamji Singh, President Malaysian Association of Private Colleges and Universities, MAPCU. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank KSI for once again inviting NAPE to be one of the collaborating organizations for the National Education and Learning Summit, and it is an honor to be invited to deliver a welcome address. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy indeed to welcome all the participants and guests to this annual summit. The summit today covers the whole education and training sector, that is higher education, school education, and TVET. And it is very close to NAPI because our membership includes all these sectors. Firstly, I would like to thank the government for recognizing the private higher education sector as an industry, which contributes close to 40 billion towards the national GDP and is projected to increase to 80 billion by 2030. Now with this contribution to the national economy, I hope there would be greater financial support to build up this industry. Education and training are important vehicles for nation building and human capital development. In supporting this initiative, the Ministry of Higher Education with the input from the private higher education sector has developed a blueprint way forward for private higher education institutions, education as an industry. We are very happy that this would help develop our private higher education sector to greater heights in the region. Ladies and gentlemen, in making this happen, we welcome and appreciate the effort by the Ministry of Higher Education in setting up Pomuda IPTS, a committee to deliberate on the reforms, including policies and regulations as outlined in the Way Forward Blueprint. And also, I'd like to thank the Ministry for inviting NAPE together with the other higher education associations onto this committee. I hope similar initiatives would be carried out by the Private Schools Division of the Ministry of Education and the TVET Division of the Ministry of Human Resources, where there would be greater engagements with the industry players in coming up with policy reforms to support the new norm. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope the discussions and deliberations today would provide inputs to the above initiatives in further addressing the challenges faced by the education sector. Under the current pandemic situation and turbulent times, one of the key challenges faced by the whole education and training sector is sustainability. Although there was no stimulus package announced during the uh, lockdown, I hope there will be some support during the recovery period which may take a year or two. So hope the reforms to education policies and, and processes would address this. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, with these remarks, I would like to once again welcome all of you to this summit and hope there would be active engagements and to KSI Shabas for organizing this event. Thank you. Dr. Mansur Othman and um, Dr. Dr. Yusuf Yaakob and my dear friend Tansri Michael Yeo and uh, another very good friend and old friend Ilan Solen 
and all my colleagues and friends out there on the floor and those who might be online uh, tuned into this event. The advantage of being a third speaker is I can easily say everything I wanted to say has been said. That's the easy part. But I think um, what I'd like to share is that we should not forget that the private sector today has 50.3% of all Malaysian students in tertiary education. It is no longer an industry, if we can call it that, um, that's just supplementing the public sector. It's an integral part of the Malaysian higher education landscape. This cannot be ignored. The exciting thing is that since last year, um, a new chapter dawned on us. There's a lot more engagement between the ministry and the sector, which has been unprecedented. Uh, Professor Allen had just mentioned the way forward. This was a mammoth effort on the part of industry and officials from the ministry to get together and for once in the spirit of development come up with a plan going forward. And that's why I say it's exciting. During the pandemic, there were several representations made to how this, this sector can be managed uh, during a situation like that. And I think credit must be due when it's due. I must say, and I was sharing this with my colleague Nicholas earlier uh, this morning, everybody worked so hard. I'm talking about people who make policies. I am not going to talk politics. This is nothing to do with politics, new government, old government, nothing. But I must take my hats off for the way the ministries worked, the way the ministers all worked. There were no such things as weekends or public holidays. I remember um, making a presentation to the Minister of Higher Education on Labor Day. That's the 1st of May. And then several presentations to EAC, and it could have been all days and nights, it doesn't matter. And they will quickly set up another appointment the next day, and they said, okay, let's get this presentation right. Uh, come back again tomorrow with the changes, and it went on and went on. And then I was finally doing a presentation on a Saturday to Minister in APU, Mustafa Mohamad. And he wasn't too happy with one or two slides, and he says, can you change this? See me tomorrow? I said, sir, tomorrow is Sunday. He said, yes, come back to my office. Um, and there he will go. And when he was happy, he said, let's go and see the PM. And that happened on a Tuesday. So, you see, people worked very hard, no bureaucracy and things like that. And there were just five points to be presented to the PM and said, this is what the industry wants. We also made it very clear that, sir, we have not come here to ask you for money. We've asked, we are coming here to help you recover um, because we were getting, the country was getting into a recovery phase. So we recognize that stimulus is over. So we're not coming here for money. And we are here with a noble ask of helping us facilitate so that the industry can recover. That went very well and that's where Pamuda IPTS was set up. We asked for a, um, an overarching um, a group, a task force that will help us cut through the bureaucracy of various agencies because that's been one of our challenges, dealing with agencies separately, dealing with KDN separately, MQA separately, my MQA friend is sitting right in front, and uh, dealing with the Ministry of Higher Education separately. And while dealing with them, the message gets lost and, um, and we end up with nothing. And that's been going on for decades. So finally, now we have Pamuda IPTS, which is modeled after Pamuda that is chaired by the Chief Secretary to the government. And uh, it cuts across all agencies 
and hopefully uh, this will help us go forward. The guiding principle behind it is the Mehmet document that was created, which is called Way Forward, and it encapsulates all the issues that we face um, and uh, all the impediments that need to be removed uh, to facilitate this industry. Now, facilitating this industry is good for the country because at the end of the day, if we have 50.3% of all Malaysian tertiary students in the private sector, it also means that we produce 50% of the talent requirements of this country. That cannot be ignored. If this industry did not exist, then the government would have to double its budget for higher education. And now it does it, now it facilitates, it, it, it actually all happens without having to, to spend any more. And it's grown on its own steam. This is one industry that's become so significant and it has to be applauded because it's grown without, without, and I say that again, any government aid. It's grown on its own steam over the last 40 years. And even today, um, there is nothing in budget announcements for the last 20 to 30 years that actually provides any incentives or provisions for private ed education. So I think we have to be proud that we have never been given a tongkat to um, manage ourselves. Uh, we've grown on our own steam and, um, and the entrepreneurial spirit of people in this room have got to be applauded and outside too. Um, and I was again talking to Nicholas this morning and now saying these are exciting times. Uh, people see it as doom and gloom. Yes, it's doom and gloom, but every doom and gloom has got opportunities within that. So the question is whether we are able to redesign and reset ourselves, realign ourselves, and uh, whether we are agile enough to adapt, because you can't change the scenario and there's no point crying over it. So let's get up and be a bit more innovative and whether the storm, such storms will appear again. We are still very fortunate as a country, we don't suffer earthquakes and various other calamities I mean, there are other people in other countries that have got to go a lot through more. Now, the danger is every time I'm given a mic, you have to stop me. <laughs> so I won't go on now, but everything that has to be said earlier has been said. But I think we have to work together. And um, just like we have struggled through the last 40 years, uh, we have to come through this even stronger. Because after every crisis, um, if we do the right things, we can always be much stronger and do our part for the country. And that 50.3% is something that has grown every year. Every year. Yeah, it was nowhere 20 years ago, and today it's 50.3, and one day it will be 60, and then higher and higher, and let's do, do our part for nation building. Thank you very much. Rotation. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Salam sejahtera Good morning to all Before I start I would like to convey a very warmest uh, regard Salam hormat From uh, Honorable uh, Minister Dr. Dr. Nurani Ahmad Who are unable to attend uh, this important uh, occasion She has to be somewhere on a very very important uh, appointment today so she said all the best for all of us for this occasion. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, Yang Muhammad, uh, Dato Dr. Yusuf, uh, Dato Dr. Yusuf, uh, Dato Ben Yaakob, Minister of Education and Innovation, Sabah, for being able to, uh, to be here today. Bahagia Tan Sri Dr. Makalio, President KSI Strategy Institute of Asia Pacific, Associate uh, Professor uh, Elijah Stolan Mohan, President National Association of Private Education Institutions, NAPE, 
and Datuk Pramjit Singh, President Mission Association of Private Colleges and Universities, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. Let us all be grateful that by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are able to gather here at the National Education and Learning Summit 2020. It is an honor indeed to greet you all and to particularly extend a warm welcome to the distinguished guests. I would like to thank the organizers, KSI Strategic Institute for Asia Pacific, National Association of Private Educational Institutions, NAPE, and National Association of Private Colleges and Universities, MAPSU, for inviting me to officiate this significant uh, event. The nation higher education in global rankings and the challenges ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, this year is the country's best achievement so far in the QS World University Rankings 2021. First, for the first time ever, all five nation research universities, UC Malaya, UC Putra Malaysia, UC Kebangsaan Malaysia, UC Science Malaysia, and UC Technology Malaysia have been ranked among the world's top 200. And in the meantime, three private universities have also jumped to the group of 500 best universities all around the world. And the universities are Taylor's University, UCSI University, and University Technology Petronas, UTP. The QS report also stated that Malaysia is one of the countries that showed the best improvement. Malaysia's oldest university, Shimlaya, UM, now ranks 59th and 11th spot from 70th last year with a 70.1 overall score and also showing tremendous success in University Putra Malaysia, UPM, from 159th place to 132 positions while the position of the National UC Malaysia, UKM, jumped from 160 to 141. Meanwhile, three IPTS managed to be inside the group of 500 best universities in the world. The universities are Taylor's University, UCSI, and Petronas University of Technology. And congratulations to all the universities. Polytechnic and community colleges are also not lacking behind in the international ratings. Thus, I would also like to extend my heartiest congratulations to 10 polytechnics who have achieved accreditation from Asia Pacific Accreditation and Certification Commission, APEC. Nine of uh, it is in the top 10 list of the 28 countries receiving gold award. This shows that our polytechnics are competitive globally and pose as an excellent benchmark of technical and vocational education training streams Tibet in the Asian Pacific region. This proves that the country's higher education is on the right track in providing quality higher education institutions in line with Malaysia Education Blueprint 2015 and 2025, as mentioned earlier. This success will continue to place Malaysia as a higher education hub in the region and will help forge collaborations between institutions and world-renowned researchers. And I would like to reiterate that we must, we must not be complacent with our achievements and the federal rankings that we have achieved thus far. Yes, the universities are doing well and making positive strides forward, but we have the potential to do better. It goes without saying that what lies before us is indeed an arduous journey and we must be prepared. And whilst we cannot predict what lies ahead, we can always undertake steps to prepare ourselves for any eventualities. And let's touch a little bit on COVID-19 pandemic. Distinguished guests, no one has ever expected that 2020 will be a very challenging year for all of us. Epidemic COVID-19 has now become a thriving pandemic all over the world. Globally, there have been more than 15 million confirmed cases of COVID-19, including over 600,000 deaths reported to, HO, to WHO. 
What started out as a health crisis is also an unprecedented socio-economic crisis with the potential to create devastating social, economic and political effects that will leave deep and long-standing scars. The COVID-19 outbreak has impacted businesses of all sizes and industries of various kinds. The World Bank projects, the World Bank project, a US uh, 110 billion decline in remittances this year, which could mean 100 million people, 800 million people will not be able to meet their basic needs. And the COVID-19 pandemic has indeed hit us hard. The higher education sector is not exempted. In another report, World Bank stated that as of April 8, 2020, universities and other 33 education institutions are closed in 175 countries and communities and over 220 million post-secondary students or 13 percent of the total number of students affected globally have had their studies ended or significantly disrupted due to COVID-19. And according to International Association of Universities, IAU, more than 1.5 billion students and youth across the planet has affected by school and university closures in 195 countries. From pre-primary to higher education due to the COVID-19 outbreak, UNESCO reported that while this figure is dropping, 1.3 billion learners in 186 countries are still unable to attend school. And of the 195 countries that had closed schools in April, 128 have yet to announce plans for their reopening. And the movement control order, while at home, eh? the movement control order MCO imposed by the government has deeply impacted the tertiary education sector in Malaysia. During MCO, the teaching and learning TNL processes across all higher education institutions, HEIS, in Malaysia has been disrupted in that regard. And Malaysian National Security Council, MKN, has come up with a guideline for operations during the MCO, CMCO, and post-CMCO for higher education sector. The guidelines contain standard operating procedures, SOP, to be followed by all HEIS in Malaysia. Undoubtedly, emphasis on digital education is a clear step forward. Thus, Ministry of Higher Education, Mohe, is committed in redesigning the local higher education system, in ensuring the success of flexible education, including in enhancing the massive open online courses, programs which are being implemented across HEIS in Malaysia. However, even if classes can move online, challenges remain. You are all aware of the inequalities that online learning can create as students from lower socioeconomic status find it more difficult to access to IT infrastructure and internet packages. One cannot assume that all tertiary students enjoy unlimited uh, internal access or possess laptops or desktops that allow them to attend online classes freely. In the Internet User Service 2018, conducted by the Malaysian Communications and Multimedia Commission, there is a sizable disparity between urban and rural internet users. Urban users made up of 70% of internet users, while rural users only accounted for 30%. The ratio of internet users by strata is 2.3 urban users to 1.0 rural users. In addition to issues of access and internet connectivity, not all programs can be supported by online technology, such as lab-based research programs. Examinations, which constitute a component of the overall evolution of students, also cannot be postponed indefinitely. And apart from that, as to the graduating students for the year of 2020, the pandemic has taken away their chances to secure their dream jobs in the shrinking domestic job marketing job market following the economic instability due to the global COVID-19. Thus, impact the nation graduates employability or GE. These are the challenges that the government and MOHE has to overcome to place the nation higher education back on track. 
Now, rethinking nation education, gearing up for the fourth industrial revolution. Ladies and gentlemen, currently we are on the perspective of what the World Economic Forum calls the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution or R4.0 is a phenomenon characterized by advances in technologies such as artificial intelligence, AI, augmented or virtual reality, big data analytics, and the Internet of Things. These technology advancements, when adapted in the workplace, are enabling new ways to exclude work, bringing new opportunities for value creation of to business and organizations, paving the way for the formulation of digital ecosystems and collaborations, as well as engagement with consumers at a greater scale. The IR 4.0 will reduce the gap between digital and physical world, keeping ultra-modern developments in view and amalgamation of physical and digital systems will prove to be revolutionary. To elevate from the current state universities are required to prepare curriculum, academicians and students alike. Thus, academia should weigh their capabilities, putting effort to equip our generations with latest technology, with latest knowledge and skills to face future realism. Universities are required to enhance their approach and methods of education. Latest technologies such as big data analytics, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, and Internet of Things, cloud computing, and other advancements need to be focused for students to learn its application. But how should this impact on education? The evidence of dramatic change is all around us and is happening at the exponential speed. Future workers will need to be highly trained in the emerging technologies, but also as importantly, in the values associated with using these, those technologies. In the future, we must not only possess the ability to develop the technology, but also to know whether, when, and where to use that technology. That kind of thinking is both reflective and interdisciplinary. And an outlook on the Moheski Initiative to embrace the wave of R4.0. The Ministry of Higher Education plays an important role in creating the best higher education system in public universities, PU, or private higher education institution, PHEI, polytechnics, and even community colleges. All these institutions are the main components of the national education and training ecosystem that will generate thinkers, scientists, scholars, skilled and semi-skilled workforce in accordance with their respective roles. We place great importance towards preparing the nation's human capital with the appropriate and relevant knowledge, skill set, and values to face the dynamic challenges of the 21st century, which is heavily influenced by evolving innovation and technologies which shape the RR 4.0. Thus, we have produced the document on framing Nation Higher Education 4.0, Future Proof Talents, the Nation Higher Education 4.0 Framework, highlighted four focus areas to address the challenges brought by R4.0. The focus areas are future-ready curriculum, agile governance, research and innovation, and talent planning. Likewise, Jabatan Pendidikan Polytechnic and College Committee, JPPKK, also has developed a TVET 4.0 framework, 2018-2025, which has to, to position the TVET education system for the country. And the six strategic trusts are quality TVET graduates, responsive and sustainable governance, technology-driven talent, TVET education system, industry and community collaboration, and applied research and innovation. IR 4.0 Action Plan Framework for MOHE also addresses the issues and challenges brought about by R4.0, such as one, universities need to emphasize their role in shaping future technology by being the test base for innovation and educating future operations. Second, the overchanging landscape causes dynamic changes in industries' needs. And thirdly, the fact that 65% of children entering primary school today will end up working in completely new job types that don't yet exist. And four, 
there is a real need to strengthen the symbiotic cooperation between industry, academia, government, and community. And lastly, the need to enhance the innovation culture in Malaysia. This framework consolidates all the initiatives we have done and we are going to embark on, on with focus on Education 4.0 where we aim to have education as facilitator, embrace new technologies such as artificial intelligence, provide a future reading curriculum, lifelong learning for all, and last but not least, producing multi-skill and multidisciplinary learners for the future job market. And the framework will require an approach and an ecosystem that optimizes the relationship between process, talent, and technology. And to bring together a successful framework, a well-coordinated implementation plan followed by monitoring is crucial. While it has taken a lot of effort to develop the plan, it is only the beginning. What matters now is the outcome what each of us can do and will do to make the plan a reality. As Peter Drucker once said, plans are only good intentions unless they immediately degenerate into hard work. And in order to achieve the vision set, Mohe has come up with four strategies. Strategy one, strengthening education governance system to R4.0. Strategy two, enhancing education 4.0 ecosystem. Strategy three, developing highly skilled and knowledgeable talent for R4.0. For R and lastly, strategy four, enhancing research and innovation towards R4.0. Under these four strategies, 13 initiatives have been put forward, which includes those that have been implemented and to be implemented in the future. Now, what is the way forward? Ladies and gentlemen, the Ministry of Higher Education will continue with its plans previously outlined to develop future-proof graduates with the right set of skills, abilities, and humanistic values. We all acknowledge that globalization and R4.0 will change the future of employment, with many current jobs no longer existing in the years to come. The ministry had engaged industry players to provide an annual evaluation of programs offered at various higher education institutions to ensure they adhere to industry needs to ensure that Malaysian's graduates to become more marketable. And the ministry will also encourage institutions of higher learning to tie up with industries in a multi-sector partnership to identify, recognize, and mitigate any risk that R4.0 may pose for its graduates, ensuring they stay competitive against the type of increasing automation and machines. These partnerships should involve an entire ecosystem of academic content, develop, and delivery including regular program reviews, joint certification, an open partnership, an open internship, and job opportunities for students. Courses to prepare students for the future workforce should be introduced in secondary schools and in TVET institutions to ensure the relevancy of education to the needs of RR 4.0. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, Transforming Malaysian higher education sector for R4.0 is not a short-term process where many institutions have experienced significant challenges. A supportive policy environment is required over the next decade to provide transformative education and allow them to execute these long-term strategies to draft the R4.0 Agenda for Human Capital Development Requirements. In moving forward, we must all work together in a more concerted manner in bringing our higher education system to a greater height. As the future is a challenging one, we need to be resilient, versatile, and adaptable to change. As the R4.0 takes place today, we require a thorough preparation that will get us moving forward, all get up to face this challenge. As Eric Coleman states in his book, Five Simple Keys to Success and Influential Digital Leader. Mapping, planning, and having a vision are important, but it's being flexible 
when the unexpected occurs, that is the key to digital success. And sometimes, however, external factors beyond our control will require us to take a different path toward our destination. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I would like to express my appreciation to KSI, NAPE and MAP2 for organizing this summit. I believe this event will spark innovative thoughts and new ideas for us to leap forward. And conventions such as, such as this provide a valuable opportunity for education, for educators to share their knowledge and experiences. I'm sure you will have fruitful and rewarding exchanges throughout the event. And on that note, this Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of God and most gracious, most merciful, I officially declare open the National Education and Learning Summit 2020. Thank you. Wabillahi taufiq. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.